Amen. Well, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make a boast in the Lord, the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together, for the Lord is good. Somebody say he's just good some of the time. Nah, he's good what? Well, you ought to give him a praise this morning like you know the Lord is good. Now nah, that's good enough for me. I say you ought to give the Lord a praise this morning like you know the Lord has been good to you. I ain't talking about what somebody told you. I'm talking about what you've experienced in your own life. The goodness and the mercy of Jesus Christ. God is so good. God is awesome. And it is just another extension of God's goodness and his mercy that we are here on this morning. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity and express um, my deepest thanks and gratitude to each and every single one of you um, that made um, last week what it was. My heart um, was overjoyed as well as all of those that were in attendance. And I just want to thank you for, for anything that you did and for just showing up. I want to thank you for being there. And I thank you for being a part. Um, and with the help of the good Lord, I look forward to the next 50 years. Amen. <laughs> Amen, amen, amen. God is good, God is good. Anybody come to hear a word from the Lord this morning? That was, that was half of y'all. I guess the other half of y'all still at the house, still asleep, still trying to get the crust out your eyes, still trying to get yourself together. Did anybody come to hear a word from the Lord this morning? Amen, amen. You came to the right place. You came to the right place. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Grass withers, fire with the earth shall fade away, but the word of our God shall stand forever. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Pass me now, O gentle Savior, Lord, and hear my humble.
and we're calling you Savior. Oh, sweet Savior, Savior, why don't you hear my, my humble cry? We had read verses 14 through 18, but for our consideration this morning, I just want us to go to verse number 18. And the Bible reads, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with with the Spirit. Even though you don't know what I'm going to say, go ahead and give the Lord a praise for the message this morning. <laughs> I would if you would flank me with your prayers this morning. Look over to somebody this morning, look like they came to have church and say, have you been drinking tonight? <laughs> they came to church all holy and decked out this morning. Look at the other one and ask them, say, hey, have you been drinking tonight? The words of our text are penned by the famed Apostle Paul. And I can say without fear of contradiction that Paul is among the brightest stars in God's galaxy of human greatness. From the moment of his cataclysmic conversion on the road to Damascus, where he was going to apprehend Christians and he himself ended up getting apprehended by Christ. He had a burning zeal, he had a desire, he had a passion to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the wider world. And because Paul had this uh, magnificent obsession with the divine compulsion, he ended up having many ports stamped on his gospel passport. And he journeyed on three different missionary journeys. And Paul literally honeycombed all of Asia Minor, shared the gospel about a risen Savior who is alive, loose, and available. Paul was so passionate about it that he would go over land and sea just to tell one convert about the goodness and the love and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was a man who had passion and don't ever underestimate the need for and the power of passion when you are pursuing the purposes of God in your life. Paul had passion and that passion gave him the capacity to push past the problems and the perplexities that plagued him in his pursuit for carrying out the purposes of God. Passion gives you the capacity to take a licking and keep on ticking. Amen, somebody. When you, when you, when you, when you got passion about what God is calling you to do, you don't let folk rolling their eyes at you stop you from doing the work of God. When you, when you got passion, you don't let, you don't wave the white flag and surrender at the first sight of challenges in your life. Paul had passion that helped him to push past the challenges of the things that he had to face in the pursuit of God's purpose. And if there was anybody that had problems, if there was anybody that had tests, if there was anybody that had trials, Paul did. Yeah. Didn't he have them, y'all? Yeah. Paul said in his own letters, I've been beaten. Yeah. 
Yeah, I wasn't just beaten, but I was shipwrecked. I wasn't just shipwrecked, but a night and a day I spent that in the sea. He was stoned and left for dead at Berea, and he was deserted at critical times by his so-called friends, and he was stabbed in the back by people that he trusted. He even had his own apostolic leadership called into question. The things that he taught was twisted by the enemies and used for their own personal gain. Paul even had a thorn in his flesh. And he prayed to God not once, not twice, but three different times. And God said, no, 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 but my grace is sufficient for you. If anybody had reason to quit and give up, it was Paul. Almost at every turn, Paul had a problem or a problematic people that he had to deal with. But because Paul had passion in the face of the problems, listen what Paul writes. He says, I have learned. In whatever state I find myself, therein I have learned how to be content. Paul said, listen, I know how to be full. And Paul said, I also know how to be empty. He said, I know how to be rich. And I also know how to be poor. I know how to have good friends. And I know how to have no friends at all. Paul said, I know what it's like to have a lot of money and not lose my mind. And I know what it's like to have nothing and not lose my faith. Paul said, I know what it's like because I got to have a lot of friends. And I also know what it's like to have no friends at all. And Paul, 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 he stayed faithful. Paul, when everyone turned their back on him, Paul stayed faithful. Paul said, I can do all things. I can do anything. I can do everything through Christ that strengthens me. Paul was not about to let anybody turn him around. Paul said, I ain't perfect, but I'm pressing toward the mark of the, of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And I'm not backing down because I know in whom I have believed that I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that, that I have entrusted in him. It was not easy by a long shot. Matter of fact, it was impossible to turn Paul around. He had been through too much. He had seen too much. He had experienced too much in his own personal experiences with Jesus Christ. So Paul was a man who had passion. But Paul was not only a man of passion, Paul was also a man of keen intellect. Apparently he was the recipient of a grade A education. Paul not only had the best education, but he also bragged about being able to sit um, at the feet of the famed Rabbi Gamaliel. And, and not only had a Hebrew education, but he was also educated in the ways of the dominant culture and in the ways of the Greeks. So Paul was an intelligent man. And, and let me just pause here parenthetically for the fact that I'm glad that somebody like Paul was a man of intelligence because it means that you don't have to leave your head in the vestibule just to have worship. It's all right to shout, but you ought to at least know what you're shouting about. Amen, somebody. So Paul was a man who had passion and he also had a keen intellect. And I'm so glad that Paul was educated and had intellect because his intellect in the scriptures and his intellect in the culture served him well as an evangelist. Because whenever Paul went somewhere, he would first go to the Jews and use the Old Testament to convince them that Jesus was the Messiah. But he said, even though I am a Jew, I have been called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. But when Paul went to the Gentiles, he could reference the scriptures because they did not have the scriptures. And so Paul had to find a place of meeting so that he could use that to touch them, to bring them into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. It's like when Paul was at Athens. Y'all remember that when Paul was at Athens? 
Paul had escaped and he had gone there to Athens waiting for his ministerial colleagues to come so that they could do ministry in Athens. But Paul looked in Athens and the Bible says that he was disturbed by the things that he saw. He saw people that were wholly given over to idolatry. And so Paul decided that he couldn't wait on his ministerial friends. And so Paul rose up his sleeves and decided that he was going to take Athens all by himself. And I praise God that I was able to stand in the very place that Paul read these words. And when he went to the Agora and the marketplace, he started preaching. And when he heard what he said, he said, they need, they, he said, you know what? You need to speak to the people who are responsible for the scriptures because they didn't have the Hindu who are responsible for the spiritual well-being of the people. And so he goes to the Acropolis, stood out on the Areopagus, stood on the stone of imprudence, and address the Athenian intelligence about a God whom they ignorantly worship. He said, you know, I've been through your town and I've seen all these altars everywhere and I came upon this one altar that said with the inscription to the unknown God. That's the God that I'm going to talk to you about. And when he started preaching, he did not reference the Old Testament scripture but he quoted one of their Greek poets. He said that it is in him that we live, in him that we move, and in him that we have our being. And he was talking about a God and even though he was not quoting the scripture, he was telling the truth even though it came from Greek literature because truth anywhere is for Christians everywhere. I said truth anywhere is for Christians everywhere. What I'm trying to get you to see is that Paul, Paul was a man with passion. And, and Paul was a man of intellect, and when his hand and his heart held hands, it made for a combustible combination of evangelistic efficiency. Amen, somebody. Paul went through everywhere, sharing the gospel everywhere he went. I love what I love about Paul is that Paul ended up writing over half of the New Testament scripture about, and about this book of Ephesians. It is simply more, more fruit from the tree of Paul's theological genius. And what's marvelous about the book is this. I love, I, lo I love the book of Ephesians, not only because of what's in it, but because of where Paul wrote it. I love it, not just because of what's in it, but because of where Paul wrote it. He is not writing it while he's reclined in a plush, palatial palace. Nor did he write it while he was sitting at some um, prestigious professorial desk in a house. But Paul wrote this from the vantage point of a jail cell. Yes, but what I like about Paul is that Paul had the capacity to see the bright side in every situation. Paul had that capacity and Paul, even though incarcerated, did not sit in jail with his thumb in his mouth, having a perpetual pity party, feeling sorry for himself, but Paul understood that it's possible to bloom right where you're planted. Paul, 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 he decided he would make the best of a bad mess. He said, I don't like where I am, but instead of serving time, I'm going to let time serve me. And so Paul, instead of being preoccupied with his own pain, had a man lifted above himself and decided to write and encourage these Christians. Let me pause here for a second and say that one of the ways that you can get over your own self is to stop being so preoccupied with your own situation and try to help somebody else every now and then. Paul, 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 he wrote, he wrote to the Ephesians to encourage the Ephesians while he was incarcerated. And when he wrote this letter, it's a letter that teaches both by its substance and by its structure. Just the way the book is put together is a teaching tool because if you look at the book of Ephesians roughly, half of the book of Ephesians, the first half is doctrine. And the second half is duty. I said the first half is doctrine, and then the second half is duty. Paul tells us what we ought to believe in the first half, and then he tells us how we ought to behave in the second half. Y'all follow what I'm saying? 
this is what you learn over here. This is how you live based on what you have learned. Over here is orthodoxy, but over here is orthopraxy. Paul says, first of all, this is what you're supposed to learn. And he gives them some good doctrine. In part one, in chapter one, he says that we have been redeemed. Let the church say redeemed. redeemed. We have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Then he comes to chapter two and he says, not only are we redeemed, but you have been resurrected. Let the church say resurrected. resurrected. He said that you have been raised from Christ in the day, but with Christ in the day, which means that before you met Christ, you were not just lost, you were dead. Hey, hey. But he said that because of Christ, you have been raised to a new life. Not only does he say that, but later in chapter 2, he said that you have been reconciled. Let the church say reconciled. reconciled. He said you Gentiles were afar off with no hope and no way to get back to God. He said, but you have been broke close. I don't know why nobody ain't shouting here right now. He said that you were far away. You couldn't even get to God. So a God that you couldn't get to came down to you because he know that you couldn't make it. Y'all don't even know what the gospel is about this morning. Y'all don't even know what the gospel is about. It's about a people that couldn't get to God. So God decided to come and save his people. He came stepping down through 42 long generations to come and see about you and to come and see about me. So Paul says that we have been redeemed. That we have been resurrected. And then he says that we have been reconciled. And he says now, in light of what he says, what worthy, chapter number four, he says, what worthy of the vocation wherewith you have been called. Same chapter, later in verse chapter number four, that you know that you ought to put off the old you and put on the new you. Then in chapter five, he said, be imitators of Christ. Then in verse number eight, he said that you were darkness, but you're now light. Notice, notice that he didn't just say that you were in darkness. He said you were darkness. He's not talking about an environment. He's talking about your identity. He said you were darkness, but you are now light. Then by the time you get to chapter 6, he said this is how you fight the good fight of faith. Put on the whole arm of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Put on the girdle of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. Have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and the word of God that cuts going and coming. And after you've done all that you can, when the dust settles, stay. Look at your neighbor this morning and just say, stay. I know you think you're going to fall, but stay. I know it feel like you're going to sink, but stay. I know it feel like you're going to fall over, but stay. Paul said, Paul said this. This is what Paul does. He says, he says, he says, he says, it's all right to know what you believe. But you don't learn what you believe so that you can impress people with what you know. You tell somebody you know it so you can live it. My grandmother would say it like this. If you got good religion, then you show how to show some kind of sign. Y'all ain't helping me this morning. If you got good religion, then you ought to show comes out, comes out of that. In fact, Dr. Martin Luther King said that one of the problems with the church in his day is that the church suffered from a high blood pressure of creeds and anemia of deeds. And I got issues with the evangelical church that we got today. And my issue is that you say that you know the Bible and you are steeped in what you call the doctrine. But I can't tell by the way you treat people that are not like you. I said it, I meant it, I'm here to represent it. If you're going to be a child of God, stand up on the word of God. Paul says, Paul 
says it's one thing to believe, but it's another thing to believe in a way. Jesus says, why do you call me, Lord, Lord? But you don't do the things that I ask you to do. And so, and so, and so Ephesians, Ephesians is instructed even in instruction. But brothers and sisters, what shouts me is that God tells us what we ought to believe and then he calls us to a way that we ought to believe. But you can't do God's work without God's help. You can't live a godly life without help from heaven. What I love about God is that he never calls you to live a certain way without giving you everything that you need to live. And church, I got good news for you. That the key to living out what you know is in chapter 5, verse 18. Come on now. Teach it. It is the hinges upon which the door of opportunity swings. The door of obedience swings on chapter 5 and verse number 18. Here's the key to living out the life that God has called for you to live. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. I can tell by the look on y'all face. I need to break that down like a fraction. I, I can tell. I can tell. I can tell. Give me a minute and I'll guess that. Paul says, Paul says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. That is the key to having what you need to live the life that God has called for you to live. And I love that Paul has this, uh, he has this uh, incredibly indigenous way of being able to look at negative circumstances and find some positive things in it. Because he finds a positive principle by looking into that negative page. When Paul had them read this letter to the Ephesians, and when they heard be not drunk with wine. They heard it, and some of them started having flashbacks. Uh-huh. Lord have mercy. Just like some of y'all have right now. Keep going. Yeah, you, you can act all sanctimonious if you want to. I don't care how white that dress is that you got on. I don't care how black that suit is that you Y'all know what I'm talking about. Quit being holy. He said, and be not drunk with wine. Paul, Paul knew. Paul knew how to reach into what's negative. I proved that Paul had that propensity to look at what's negative and draw out a positive. Look back, and you go back to chapter six, where he's talking about put on the whole armor of God. I wonder where he got them ideas from. Come on, Can I tell you? Paul was a brother that was, that was accustomed to a jail cell. Come on, and he spent a lot of time chained to Roman soldiers. But because he refused to feel sorry for himself, God breathed on his mind while he was looking at the Roman soldier. And see, Paul realized that when you look at something the way God wants you to look at it, that he wasn't chained to a Roman soldier, but the Roman soldier was chained to him. Which means that he had a captive audience. Help me preach on the God. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the conversation that must have been going on between Paul and this soldier? I'm sure Paul must have been writing something down or studying something. And he looked at the man and said, huh, what's your name? My name is Paul. How long have you been a Roman soldier? Do you like the job? Do you have a family? What are the benefits like? And I'm sure somewhere along in the interchange and the exchange of the conversation, he said, well, I got to ask you, do you know a man named Jesus? And whether that soldier wanted to hear it or not, he had to stay there and listen to Paul for his whole shift. Talk about the goodness of God. But that ain't the point that I'm going to make. The point I want to make is that he's looking at his enemy. But God breathes on his mind and he shows him by looking at his enemy that he can take something from his enemy and use it to teach something positive to his friends. He looked at the armor on the soldier and said, you know what? We can use these symbols of what we need to live a victorious life. 
Paul is just doing that again. When he looks at the past of the people, he said the key to victorious living is found in the past that you've been living in. He said you used to get drunk. But the key to your living now is not to get drunk with wine. Help me light bulbs. Don't be scared of the Holy Ghost. He said be filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't be drunk with spirits. With a little ins. But rather get drunk in the spirit with a big ins. At least you think I'm stretching the metaphor too far and I ain't in the Bible. Go back there to the book of Acts. You remember after Jesus caught a cloud and worked his way back into heaven, he left 120 people in an upper room and he said, stay there and wait for the promise. And they were praying and waiting and the Bible said that the Holy Ghost fell on them like cloven tongues of fire and they started praising God in unknown tongues. And watch the Bible, watch it. The Bible said they were in church praising God and they took their praise from the seats to the streets, from the inside to the outside from private praise to public praise and when they went outside praising God folk that had come from the four corners of the earth saw them praising God in other tongues some were confused and others said these men drunk and when they said these men drunk Peter stopped praising and started preaching he said no no buddy these are not drunk as you suppose Y'all were tough crowd this morning. Paul said, I'm not saying they ain't drunk. They just ain't been drinking what you think they been drinking. They not drunk with what you think because it's too early in the morning and the liquor store ain't even over again. This is what the prophet Joel spoke about. In the last day, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall see visions. Your young men shall dream dreams upon all flesh. I'll pour out my spirit. And when Paul said, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, that's exactly what he's talking about. Paul said, the key to victorious living is learning how to live under the influence. Yes! 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 yes. yes. You got to learn how to live a little inebriated. I'm almost done with this little Sunday school lesson. You got to learn. You got to learn how to live a little tipsy. You got to learn. Tell somebody you got to learn to live drunk. You got to learn to live drunk. Don't be offended. Just watch the parallels. Because you can tell when a person is drunk with wine. Can't you tell? Can't you, tell? you don't even have to know them. And you can tell if they've been drinking or not. Because when you're drinking, it gets in your talk. You don't talk the way that you used to talk. In fact, when you are inebriated, you will say things drunk that you wouldn't say so. I wish I had some help in sweet water this morning. When you are under the influence, you can tell because it gets in you walk. Look, when you are, when you are under the influence, you can tell when a person been drinking. In fact, when you've been drinking, it affects how you treat the people around you. Paul is saying, Paul is saying, remember, remember how you were when you were drunk in the world. He said, God just wants you to get drunk in the kingdom. But God wants to give you the high without the hangover the day after. Good God Almighty. 
He said, if you get drunk in the spirit, he said, in getting your talk, you'll talk to people about Jesus and not be ashamed about your testimony. And you'll say things that you wouldn't say sober. You'll say, I love you. You'll say, I forgive you. You'll say, it's all right when you've been drinking on the Holy Spirit. You don't go where you used to go. Come on and yeah. help me preach somebody. You, you don't go where you, where you used to. You can tell when somebody been drinking. Look at your neighbor and say, man, you better get you a cup. You better, man, you better get you a cup. This is this the last call for alcohol, man. You better, you better go up there and get you some of this stuff. Now, if we go back to the original language, you got to see because you got to get an understanding yeah. of what Paul is saying. Right. Paul says in the original language in the Greek, he says, you be drunk. Mm -hmm. And the you is plural. Uh -huh. The implication is that the experience of drinking is not just an experience reserved for some super group of Christians. Uh -huh. It's supposed to be a normal lifestyle. Uh -huh. Not only is it for everybody, but Paul says it's not something you do. The Greek says it's something you allow. Yeah. You can't manufacture being filled with the Holy Ghost. A right. heaven organ don't fill you with the Holy Ghost. Right. You can you got to by faith receive what you know God is already promised. You got to do it. And the experience is not a once and for all experience. It's an experience that you ought to have over and over and over again. Because the Greek says, keep on being filled. Keep on, yeah. Yeah. Right. Keep on being filled. Yes, sir. And the reason you got to continue to be filled is because you leak. Yeah. And, you, and you know that you need to keep on being filled because when you are not filled, you can tell when you are not filled. Help me somebody. Anybody in here ever had to go to work and deal with a foolish boss? You left your house and prayed, Lord, fill me on the way to work. And by the time you get to work, you had to deal with them and you're saying, God, listen, now you're going to have to keep on filling me because I can feel the old me trying to come after me. And I'm starting to remember words that I thought I had forgotten. Amen, somebody. Lord, have mercy. Y'all ain't saying that. Have you, have you ever been talking to your boss and praying to God at the same time? Somebody say, be filled, be filled. But I'm so glad that God has not left us in this world to feel by ourselves. Ain't y'all glad about that this morning? I'm sure not glad that he didn't leave us alone. See, just because you are saved don't mean that you ain't got to deal with trials. and Don't mean you ain't got to deal with testing. Just because you are saved don't mean that you ain't got to deal with haters and hardship and hell in your life and how water. But I'm so glad. That God has not left us by ourselves. Yeah. That God has equipped me and you with what we need to have it. Yes. Thank you. you see, when I'm filled with the Spirit, it's not God giving me more of the Spirit. Because I got all the Spirit that I needed when I became a child of God. The issue is not God, whether you have more of the Spirit. But the issue is, does the Spirit have more of you? I'm going to just go ahead and have church all by myself this morning. Because some of y'all are trying to live by letting God have some areas of your life. And you don't want to give God every area of your life. Can I get one way? God don't just want to come on your front porch. He want to come in the best of you. God don't just want to come in the best of you. He want to come in the living room. He don't just want to come in the living room. He want the bottom floor. He want the top floor. He want the basement. God want everything.
you'll end up talking crazy to folk. You'll bless those that curse you. You'll do good to them that hate you. You'll pray for them that despitefully use you. Whenever you start drinking, you won't let hardship and hell keep you from serving God. You may have a frown on your heart, but there'll be a smile on your face. Because when you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, it reminds you that there is available to you joy that the world did not give. So the world is not able to take it away. And when the world is falling apart around you, the Holy Ghost will kick in and you will have peace that just don't make no sense. You will have peace that surpasses all understanding. The Bible says, is there anybody here that's mature enough to admit that you were not here to do it by yourself, but that you need holy help from heaven on high and you need some divine assistance? People get on your nerves. But when they get on your last nerve, the Holy Ghost will kick in and you'll forgive people that do you wrong. You'll love people that are unlovable. When you are filled with the Holy Ghost, not only will you shout in church, but then you will serve after the benediction. When you are filled with the Holy Ghost, you can have cuts and bruises and still have a smile on your face because you're filled with the Holy Ghost. Is there anybody in here that's been drinking this morning? Is there anybody in here feeling real good right about now? Is there anybody here that knows something happens when you start drinking? Something happens when you are filled with the Spirit of God. Grandmama said it'll put clapping in your hands. Somebody said it'll put running in your feet. Somebody said it'll make you love your enemies. Somebody said it'll make you love those that do you wrong when you feel with the Holy Ghost. It'll make you sing. It ain't no music playing. It'll make you cry. It ain't that wrong with you. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Because one day, one bright day, one glorious day, Jesus, our Savior, our elder brother, your Savior, and your Lord carried your cross and mine. He carried the cross of the Via Della Rosa to die on behalf of your sins and mine. He carried the cross as far as he could. And then a black man by the name of Simon of Cyrene helped him to carry his cross, inspiring the song, must Jesus bear the cross alone, and all the world go free. There's a cross for everyone, and I know somewhere, somebody say somewhere, there's a cross for you. They riveted his feet, they put nails in his hand. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. He hung his head. And for you and for me, he died. But that ain't how the story ends, y'all. Because three days later, three days later, he rose again with all power in his hands. You ask me how I know he lives? I can feel it in my hand. I can feel it in my feet. I feel it all over me. That's how I know he lived. He ain't dead. He's still alive. So I'm not, not going to leave you comfortless. But I'm going to give you another comfort. And that of the Holy Ghost. And how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he shall guide you into the truth and the knowledge of all things. You're not good by yourself. You need the Holy Ghost. You can't love folk by yourself. You need the Holy Ghost. You'll lie quick. You need the Holy Ghost. You'll do somebody wrong quick. You need the Holy Ghost. When you get the Holy Ghost, you'll stop walking around here mad and upset at the world like somebody owe you something. When you got the Holy Ghost, you'll learn how to forgive. 
live and forgive and get over it and move on. When you got the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. Thank you, Master. Thank you, Lord. It's not concerned. With how high you jump in praise. But whether how straight you walk in obedience to the word of God. Holy Ghost ain't come to make you do a black flip over no, no chair. The Holy Ghost ain't come to make blah, 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 blah. He can't come to make you do all of that. The Holy Ghost has come to help you. He's come to give you strength. He's come to give you the ability that you need to deal with the issues that you got to deal with. Because if you be honest with me right now, you can't do it by yourself. As much as you love your mama, it's certain things your mama can't do for you. As much as you love your dad and your sisters, and there's certain things that people can't do for you, certain things you need the whole Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's so weird. We are yes. like we scared of that word, but I ain't shame. I ain't shame. I'm glad. I'm glad that he promised me. I'm glad that I'm glad that he told them to go and wait until you're being down with power from on high. I'm glad that we got it on the day because I need power, not just on Sunday, but to deal with the folk on my job on Monday. I need the Holy Ghost to deal with my hard headed children on Tuesday. I, I need the Holy Ghost. 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 I need the you can tell if you got it or not. He says in his word, he said, if you have not the Holy Ghost, he says you are none of his. The Bible says, be ye holy, for I am holy. Read it backwards. Holy am I, and holy ye be. Either way, he says, you got to be holy. You got to be, somebody need a drink this morning. I believe, I believe, I believe some, somebody need to feel real good right about now. Somebody, somebody need to call a cab because you ain't going to be able to make it home. Somebody, somebody this morning need to have a drink. And be not drunk with wine. We're in this excess. But rather be filled with the Spirit of God. Yeah. All right. He said, ain't nothing wrong with getting drunk. Just get drunk on the right thing. Come on. Right. That's, right. It. That's it. That's it. He says now, you remember how y'all were before you came into the knowledge of Christ. You remember how you did it then. He said, I want that same intensity, but take it into a daily environment. I want that same zeal and desire, but I want you to do it in a different place right about now. And can I tell you, the Holy Ghost is not something that you can lay down and pick back up for a different time. It is not something, as I said, that you manufacture. It's something that you got to allow. The Bible says that if men, being evil, know how to give good gifts to their children, how much more shall the Heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask of it? I don't know about y'all, but I said, Lord, I need it every day. I need it every day because can I tell you what? I ain't talking about you. I'm talking about me. Some days are better than other days. Some days, some days, some days I'm doing all of what I can. And some days I fall short of doing all that I know how to do. So on those days that I can't make it, Lord, I need the Holy Ghost. On, on those days when folk work in my last nerve and I really want to keep my peace, but they steadily pushing buttons. Lord, I need the Holy Ghost. Lord, I need it to live right. Lord, I need it to serve right. Lord, I need needed to do your will. Lord, I need your spirit. I need your spirit. And be not, 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 be 
instance, but be filled with the Spirit of God. Yes, Lord. When you feel with the Holy Ghost, y'all, it is showing you walk. I ain't talking about verbally, just, just, I mean, visually, just looking at you and no. you change the way you make your steps. <laughs> <laughs> Places your car used to go. Watch out, man. Come on. The man car. <laughs> Places you used to go. You don't go anymore. The Holy Ghost will get in your talk. Folk you used to cuss out, you would say, May the Lord bless you. <laughs> And may he bless you real good. Real good. <laughs> when you got the Holy Ghost, you used to be quick to hold grudges against folk. But now you will say, child, I ain't working for I forgive you. And you matter, matter of fact, man, I mean, I've been forgave and I've been forgotten about the situation. It's over and done. When you got the Holy Ghost. Lord help me. But some of us got a ghost that ain't holy. How do I know that? Because we lie when the truth will do. Lie when the truth will do. Mercy. We get ourselves entangled in environments that you pray week upon week for God to deliver you from. God deliver you from the situation. You go right back and wallow back in the hog pen that God just got you out of. We go around doing evil, doing ill stuff to people, thinking that somehow it's going to help us to climb up the ladder, yeah, thinking yeah, somehow yeah, yeah. it's going to make us better people, not knowing that if you dig one ditch, you might as well dig two, because the very one that was meant for somebody else may very well be meant for you. That's why I need the Holy Ghost. That's why I need it. And I don't just need it on Sunday. I need a different day of my life. If thou withdraw thyself from me, Master, what shall I go? Without your spirit, I can't speak. Without your spirit, I cannot do your work. Without your spirit, I cannot be pleasing to you because you already said, if I have not the Holy Ghost, he said, I, I ain't none of his. We need God's spirit on the inside of us. But can I tell you what? Just like you don't want to live in no dirty house. Mm. Oh, all right. Come on. Come on. The Holy Ghost came dwell in an unclean temple. If you got malice in your life, the Holy Ghost can't live up in there. You can't people, the Holy Ghost can't live in there. You walking around here lying just to lie. Oh, the ghost can't live up in there. Giving a dollar when you could have given a hundred, the Holy Ghost ain't there. Come on. Because can I tell you, the Holy Ghost won't just show up in your walk, it'll show up in your gift. The Holy Ghost will affect every area of your life. But our issue is, we want to give God certain areas. God, go in, there, go in the living room. Go in the kitchen, God, open up the fridge, get you something to drink. I got some leftovers in there, get your plate for sure. But you can't come upstairs. Matter of fact, don't open that door, you can't go down in the basement. That's restricted. God don't just want part of you. He wants everything. Everything that you are and everything that you could ever hope to be, he wants it. He desires it. And just as a hen gathers her chicks on the wings, yes, that's, yes. How, that's how the Spirit of God wants to overshadow yes, your life. Yes, Lord. I mean, yes, Lord. Yes. And can I tell you, when the Holy Ghost has covered you, mm-hmm. and when it's present in your life, you could be in a crowd of devils and somebody say, they were God's child right there. Yes, can I tell you, man, everybody else can be going left. You'll be the only one that go right when you got the Holy Ghost. Can I tell you, the Holy Ghost is in this in moments when you're about to make decisions that you know you ain't got no pity to make it. The Holy Ghost step in and say, I, I, now you know. Come on now. Come on now. You know you've been here before. You already know we all not do this. Thank God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lord. 
the yep. third personality of the deity in the Godhead. Yes, sir. God the Father has always been in heaven. God yep. the Son yep. came, lived among us, died, rose again, and went back to heaven. Yep. Now God the Holy Spirit yep. lives in each and every single one of us. Yes, Lord. Thank you. If I ain't got nothing else, I got the Holy Ghost. Yes. I may not have a lot of money, but guess what? I got the Holy Ghost.
He did no wrong. Neither was there any guile. Nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. But still, when they were given the choice between him and a notorious murderer, they said, kill Jesus and give us the rabbis. Can you see him now? He's being led from judgment hall to judgment hall. Can you see him now? As he's going before Pilate, and Pilate, Pilate said, don't you know that I got the power to take the life or I got the power to let you go free? He looked at Pilate and said, no, but he said, the only power that you got is what my father has given you from your time. He said, no man taking my life, I lay it down. And if I lay it down, I got the power to bring it back up again. Can you see it now as they're beating our master? Can you see him now? They took that cat of nine tails and they whipped him all night long. Yeah. Every time they hit him with the whip and make an impression into the master's skin. So when they pull back and rip out hunks of his flesh, but still he took it without saying a moment word. When they gave him his cross, he bore that cross, taking it up to Golgotha's hill, the place shaped like a skull. He was going up the Calvary, but even able to carry his own cross. And I told you that Simon of Cyrene had to help him carry his cross. They took him up there on the hill and they stretched him out on the cross. And they took nails. And our day would be railroad spikes. And they put them in his hand. Not right here. Not right here. Put him right here. To hold him up. Put him and they put his feet together, they put nails in his feet. They hung him up on the cross. So can you see him down there? Every time you want to take a breath, he got So every time he's trying to take a breath, he's he's experiencing just excruciating pain. But the prophet Isaiah had already told us that not a bone in his body was going to be broken. When the long soldier came around to make sure they were dead, he was breaking legs. But when he got to Jesus, the Bible said he was already dead. He took his spear and he stuck it up to the master's side. And the Bible said it pierced his sacred heart. Yeah. And it said that from his side came blood and water. Yeah. They let you know he was already dead because after you died, the blood and the water, they separated the body. So the word of Isaiah was true that I was born in his body. Eli, Eli, Lema, Sabathana, my God, my God. Why has God forsaken me? Because when Jesus looked up, God turned his back on him. Because when God looked at him, he didn't see Jesus. He saw our lives. Thank you, Lord. He saw the evil deeds that we did. He saw all of our sin hanging on Jesus. And he died. But he didn't stay there. Just as it said, three days later, yeah. Mary, the, man, the women get to church first time all the time. Man. You know what? They said, they said, Mary, they said, Mary, 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 they got there. They thought Jesus was going to be there. They told him, hey, gee, I thought you were looking for him. He was here. He was there. But he is not alive. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He got up. It's all power in his hands. Yeah. He holds the keys yeah. to death, hell, and the grave. Yeah. And he died, and we go back to us know that the shedding of his blood, right. he purchased the church right. with his own shed of blood. Yeah. Yeah. And he desires for you, my friend, to join him today. He desires for you, my friend, to come to him. He's standing at the door of your heart, even now, and he's knocking. Will you let him come in, son of Will you let him come in and make his abode with you? Jesus wants to come and make the difference in your life. Stop trying to do it by yourself. Stop trying to fight it by yourself. Stop trying to fend by yourself. Jesus said, I am here. I am on the scene. Whatever your disease, whatever your condition, whatever it is that you are facing, I am here to take care of the situation. Come to it now. Come hear this word. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, So then faith come by you. Hear about the word of God. As you hear, you believe the same. He said, except that you believe that I am he shall die in your sins. 
believe, repent of your sins. What is repentance? Repentance is a change in my mind that produces a change in my action. After repentance with your mouth, you made the greatest confession that you could ever make that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. You have a confession. You are willing to be baptized for the remission of your sins. Have your sins washed away, eradicated, done away with, never to rise before you. And this life, not the life that is to come, and the Lord himself will add you to his body. What you waiting on? Time may wait on you while you wait on time. Do not let it pass you by. Maybe you're here this morning, you're already Christian. You're standing in need of prayer. Let us pray for you. The Bible still says that the prayers of the righteous, they are zealous much. I say it simply like this. You know where your relationship is with God. Amen. And if there's anything other than what it needs to be, you need to come to Jesus. Yeah. Come to him now. Mm -hmm. Come now and together we stand and sing the song. I need the Lord Jesus, I need the Lord Jesus, but I need you right now, Lord.